Hi, my name is Caitlin and I'm the Scholarly Communication Informationist at the Welch Medical Library. And I'm gonna talk about preprints and preprint journal clubs. First, I'm gonna start with just the pure definition. What are preprints? So preprints, according to the NIH, are a complete and public draft of a scientific document. They're typically not peer reviewed, but they are written often in the style of a peer reviewed journal article. Um, scientists issue preprints to speed dissemination, establish priority, obtain feedback, and offset publication bias. And this is a definition from the NIH. On the other hand, journal articles are uh, perhaps quite obvious to you, peer reviewed articles that appear in and have been published in academic journals. Another sort of definition that I want to provide is that of an author accepted manuscript. And the reason for this is that there are lots of different versions of your research. And they're often called different things. And you often have different rights to share different versions, though journal policies might be a little bit confusing about what and what, what, what you can do and when you can do it. So a preprint, again, is the version that precedes formal peer review. It's uh, preprint is often made available before publication in a journal in repositories like Archive, BioArchive, MedArchive. Um, they're posted, their posting is often, or not often, but sometimes required by funders. Uh, and sometimes journals do require you to either link to your final version or take down your preprint upon publication. So it's really important to know which journals have which policies, and I'll give you some resources for that. Some researchers also annotate each other's preprints, and it's a common practice in particular disciplines. Um, it's a really good way to sort of when you think about the core values of science, perhaps for some, it might be, you know, I do my analysis and I share my work and with all my fellow scientists, and then we comment and make it better, and then we submit it to a journal. Um, there's also an author's accepted manuscript, like I said, and this is often called either an author final manuscript, or you might see postprint. You can find author's final manuscripts. It's a searchable field in PubMed Central, for example. And this is the version of your research that is peer reviewed and it is preceded, it precedes publication in a journal as well, but it is again peer reviewed. So it might not include copy editing, it might not be formatted like it would be in the final PDF that has the publisher's um, glossy logo on it, for example, uh, but is often also a version that might be required by funding agencies to be made publicly available. And a lot of journals actually do allow you to make this version publicly available in a repository or a personal website. It just depends on the journal and it's often not um, widely advertised on the journal's website that you can do this. I'm gonna go through a quick timeline of publishing really um, because we're at this really strange moment where there are so many preprints about COVID being published that it's really interesting to see how much the publishing business model or landscape has not changed until now. So in 1665, that's when the first journal was established and that's the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. All the way to the 1950s, that's when the peer review system beca becomes widely utilized. And it's not until the 1990s do journal move online, obviously to an online environment on the web. In 1991, is, that's when Archive was uh, established, and that's the first preprint repository. And it's really interesting, again, to see that uh, as a scholarly communication informationist, librarian, I'm often involved in a lot of open access work. And open access, um, a lot of the big initiatives and uh, the Budapest Open Access Initiative, for example, that did not come until much later. Um, preprint repositories preceded that. In 2011, the Center for Open Science provides repository platforms for several disciplines. And in 2013 is when BioArchive was released from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And then again, 2019, MedArchive from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And what was really interesting is when MedArchive was released, we had a researcher from Hopkins reach out to us, uh, to the library, to one of our informationists and say, this is really great that there's now um, an archive, a preprint repository for the medical clinical sciences because when I was working in um, the field during the Ebola outbreak, preprints were the only way that I was getting any data to be able to kind of advance science and help find treatments for this. This is an example of what a preprint repository looks like. And here you can see that this is MedArchive. 
Uh, there is a caution here that there are preliminary reports that have not been certified by peer review and that they should be not, not be relied on to guide clinical practice or health-related behavior. It also makes a really interesting note at the end that I will talk about a little bit later about media engagement with preprints, that these should not be reported in the news as established information. So you're gonna see how some journalists and some media have uh, signaled when they're using or citing a preprint. This is what it looks like when you drill down by subject area. And this is, um, I will say for a lot of my informationist colleagues who are excellent searchers, precision searchers, systematic reviews, they're um, really talented at what they do, it might be quite frustrating for them to search for a search through preprint repositories because it really is keyword and subject area based. Um, so you're really getting information. This is, for example, cell biology, all of the papers under cell biology, and you could add some keywords, but um, to limit it, but it is not, doesn't have the same robust capability um, as like a PubMed um, to be able to limit down research. This is what a paper looks like. This is one example of a SARS-CoV-2 uh, paper that was published in, um, in one of the preprint repositories. And you can also see some information about article usage here when you scroll over. Um, this is actually a different article, but this here you can see things, some altmetric information like 41 news outlets have picked up this research. It was tweeted over 1,500 times, um, and there are 239 readers of this preprint on Mendeley. Another question I often get is, which journals do and do not accept preprints? So right now, I only know of the New England Journal of Medicine that does not, um, I think, encourage preprints. Uh, but there are many, many, many that do, including some of the big ones you might have heard of, uh, many of them listed here. So we have PNAS, Science, Nature, and Science and Nature even have people who look through preprint repository. The Lancet encourages preprints, um, eLife, of course, and PLOS. So there's many more not listed here that encourage it. And how do you know whether or not you can post a preprint or it's allowed by the journal? First is a list of academic journals by preprint policy. So this is a Wikipedia page where you are welcome to um, check out if you search the, uh, list of academic journals by preprint policy on Google, you should be able to get right into the um, Wikipedia page that lists the journals uh, and their policies according to their preprint policies. And then Sherpa Romeo is also a really good resource for understanding not only your rights to post a preprint, but whether or not you can post and share uh, in other platforms, different versions of your research, like the publisher's PDF, the postprint or author's final manuscript or preprint on a website, in an institutional repository, on your personal website, um, and lots of other places. So that's a really good place for that information. It might also include uh, per journal information about whether or not the journal has an embargo period for your PDF, um, and lots of kind of relevant information about your sharing ability. So why are we talking about this? Um, other than there's lots and lots of preprints that are being published out there today. So the, there is a huge delay in the traditional publication process, as you can kind of see from that uh, 1665 all the way to 1991 is when preprints came on the scene. Uh, for publication times for submission to publication in journals, PubMed has a median of seven months, but it can be up to three years. Whereas in BioArchive and MedArchive, it could be 24 hours before research is disseminated. So again, looking at this delay and seeing where we, where we started to where we've come with MedArchive right now and all of the probably 3,000 plus preprints that are in MedArchive and BioArchive about COVID, there's a lot of changes that are happening. Stephen Quake has studied this a bit and he is a professor of bioengineering and applied physics at Stanford University. And he's also the co-president of the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. He has done some analysis to suggest that we could speed up scientific discovery fivefold in 10 years if everyone decides to post a preprint instead um, of waiting for that traditional process to happen with um, journal publication. So more information about why, uh, why post preprints. So we actually hosted, so Welch Medical Library and the School of Public Health hosted um, and collaborated on a preprint panel. And this was about the role of preprints in the scholarly ecosystem with the postdoc, um, Samantha Hindle from BioArchive. 
uh, Arturo Casa Duval from the School of Public Health, Cynthia Wolberger from the School of Medicine, and our postdoc was Sarvina Sarabipur. And they talked about lots of different reasons why preprints uh, are happening, why they're important, and why it might be of a benefit to post them. So first, research can be disseminated again immediately without embargoes. And Cynthia Wilberger talked about, as an NIH reviewer, often she and others do not often want to see the term in progress anymore. They want to read the work that's happening in its draft form. So please post a preprint. Uh, Richard Siever talked about bioarchive and medarchive not ranking papers like some other entities might. And that 70 to 80 percent of papers in preprint repositories might and do end up in journals. Sarvina Sarabipur talked about expanding diversity of peer reviewers. She gave some really interesting statistics about of the same of uh, those that are asked to peer review. Most people ask men to peer review, um, even women. And then the stats about um, and the, the stats are linked directly in here. So apologies if I misquote. But she said that of 20% of the same people that review the papers all the time and are always asked to peer review, only 20% of that 20% are women. So really think about um, the ways that engaging with preprints and preprint journal clubs, which I'll talk about later, could expand diversity of peer reviewers and encourage um, researchers to ask more women to peer review, um, engage their early career researchers and fellows and postdocs in this process, for example. Something else really interesting that has really changed the narrative in, within the scholarly communication landscape is establishing primacy. For so long, I had heard some, some pushback and concern about being scooped. So if I post my preprint out there, then my ideas will be scooped and my data will be scooped. Uh, recently, I heard from a team at Hopkins that they had been scooped by a preprint. They were rushing to get their research out there. They had some really exciting and novel insights in their field, but a preprint was published before they were able to submit their research. Finally, expanding your readership. Um, we, I showed you some of those stats about some kind of where research and preprints are picked up on social media, by the news, et cetera. And there are some examples that Arturo Casa Duval gave about um, his, engage, his media engagement and social media engagement with his preprints that has then been turned in, into journal articles. And yet there still are concerns. Um, so some of the concerns that I hear a lot are that the basic review by repositories could permit incorrect information to be posted. Uh, though this is definitely not limited to preprints. We are probably all familiar with some of the big um, kind of <sighs> contributors to misinformation that have come from peer reviewed journals articles, for example, um, and just the whole idea of retractions and these retractions coming from really um, prestigious journals, and that, that does happen all the time. The general public may also think it's been peer-reviewed when they come across a preprint. Um, so that's something that is, I'll, I'll show you a little bit about how the media has dealt with this with signaling. Um, so there have been some concerns about DOIs. If, if a preprint, if you get a DOI, you, when you are establishing your primacy, you put your paper up as a preprint, and now you are the one um, asserting that you have published this information, and you have your copyright to that that paper. Um, the PDF might also receive a PD, uh, at a DOI and there is some linking that needs to happen to ensure um, that there's not multiple versions floating around. The promotion and tenure system might also not yet highly value preprints. I, I, I do wonder if that will change and I do know that you can, they're citable materials and you can put a preprint in your CV. Uh, Signal does a preprint. And then there's also the need to understand some licensing options. So whether or not you're, again, allowed to post a preprint, but whether you retain your copyright to that preprint and in bioarchive, meta-archive, you are the owner of um, your research. So I mentioned signaling. This is a New York Times columnist, a tweet from him talking about a preprint. And you can see his caveat here that has not been pre-reviewed. These are ways that other media outlets have engaged with preprints and written about them, described them, that might be of interest. So here we have Science Magazine, NPR, CNN. So you're both seeing how they're signaling that they're preprints, but also that the media is seeing a change in the way that science is being disseminated. 
And this leads us to talking about preprints and COVID-19. So what is really fascinating here is the rate of preprints or the way that, again, publishing has been changing with throughout epidemics and pandemics. So right now, um, we don't have the ability or we can't wait three years to read COVID research and be able to innovate. But what's interesting is during the 2003 SARS epidemic, 93% of the papers were published after the epidemic had ended. While there's already probably over 3,000 now, but since I last updated this, since January, there are already over 2,700 preprints related to COVID. So the preprint repositories here, BioArchive, MedArchive, normally receive about 100 submissions per day for all sub-disciplines. They're receiving 100 today about COVID. So it's both um, obviously a concern for, we have to think about quality and quantity at the same time, but this dissemination and scientists wish to really kind of think about how do we innovate? How do we solve this problem when we really need it? And this is a direct um, screenshot of the aggregated COVID SARS-CoV-2 preprints in MedArchive and BioArchive, which these two repositories have correlated them into one link here. And again, some more concerns just because we have to talk about them, but there really is a bigger issue, a much bigger picture issue about misinformation on the internet, so transparency is key. So while the hydrochloroquine paper was on MedArchive, um, some of the information was also published um, as well. So there are some things to think about about the ethics of sharing particular treatments, um, et cetera, as a preprint when you can't always um, be sure that people are understanding that it's not peer-reviewed science. So we we, many researchers do, I think, understand that peer review might not catch everything and be the end-all be-all as well, um, but it is the best system that we do have for that. There are pros and cons of fast versus thorough, but the signaling does help. So this is a PNS, PNAS article about um, the need to have signals around trustworthy information and signaling the trustworthiness of science. So I encourage everybody um, to take a look. I also really want to point out this really great resource from the from Hopkins. This is the School of Public Health uh, 2019 Novel Coronavirus Research Compendium. So this is a really interesting project, and I feel like it's signaling some of the changes that are happening in scholarly communication and the, the way that we review, engage with, and collaborate across, globally to kind of innovate and ensure quality of literature that's coming out agnostic of or totally uh, independent of whether or not it's published in a journal, um, in an open access journal, a subscription journal, in a platform, in a repository, on a website, if you see it on social media. So what this group does is they rapidly curate and assess literature on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 to inform the public health community during the pandemic. So they will summarize the research and it comes from journals, it comes from preprint repositories, um, summarize and then discuss some of the limitations of the study. So this is also a really interesting tool that could perhaps be used in a preprint journal club. Similarly, here's a platform that was spun up in January in response to COVID. Uh, this aggregates from different repository, preprint repositories some of the literature based around outbreaks or about outbreaks and it encourages researchers to engage with the preprints and rate them. Um, the, uh, group asked for please review three each scientist if you reviewed three papers this would be this would really help improve the research that's out there um, so that's sort of their call to action but these are some of the questions that are asked in order to um, encourage a good review of a preprint and to advance it to the next stage and so I'm going to talk about preprint journal clubs and really briefly it's exactly what it looks like. It's a journal club that examines and assesses preprints. And there's lots of things you can do with it, but I really wanted to point out um, Dr. Castle Duvall, Hopkins researcher, he has written an, uh, an editorial about the benefits of using preprints in journal clubs. Um, the first is that preprints are free to anyone with an internet connection. You don't have to go through the library to get access. You don't have to pay a fee or hit a paywall, et cetera, to get access to your research. Um, Preprints are often the most current form of scientific literature as well. And presenting preprints will give the journal club members the ability to participate in peer review because the comments and criticisms that are generated during the discussion can be posted on the preprint servers. So not only are you keeping it in-house, but it's teaching early career researchers or your fellow scientists, peers, or students how to 
um, comment and criticize and uh, advanced scientific literature, but you can actually translate to that real world and put it in a platform um, and send it out to the rest of the world for improvement. Using preprints also de-emphasizes the current focus on selecting articles from high impact journals. Um, impact factor has long been sort of misattributed and misused um, and been biased. So journal impact factor does not always mean that it has the best science in it. Um, journal impact factor is a journal level metric that does not quite tell you much information about the particular science in the article. So that's where um, preprint journal clubs are engaging with the articles and the content and value that is within the articles rather than focusing on trying to impress your colleagues because you're picking an article from a really high impact journal. Um, and a lot of high impact journals have published a lot of science that has been retracted. So um, not to say that that's, a, any correlation or causation there, but it's just an interesting note that you really shouldn't um, assume that just because an article is in a high impact journal that it is the best science that's out there. And finally, preprints might allow a later analysis of the work by comparing the preprint with the final paper. And this could be really interesting for kind of a different form of, of assessment within a journal club instead of reading the article and either making suggestions for improvement, tearing it apart, talking about how wonderful it is, you can actually see that change between um, what was it as a preprint and where did it end up. So what, what, what review, what edits might have taken place in order to get it to its final publishable state. And this is the similar platform um, by pre-review. And this is an example of uh, what the plot platform looks like. And it's used to, it's, it's meant to crowdsource preprint reviews. So this is um, very similar to the Outbreak Science platform. And that's all I have. Thank you for taking time to learn about preprints and preprint journal clubs.